Uh, so we talked about undergraduate education. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, graduate school, uh, especially the PhD. <laughs> okay. So, uh, said, so uh, what are your opinion on uh, the relevance of PhD for twenty first century science? See, it depends on uh, which kind of science you are talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you are talking about the kind of stuff that they do in industries, a lot of which is pure grunt work. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, simply running as many PCRs as you can on a given day or uh, optimizing as much as you can on a given day. Much of those things will probably not require PhDs. It will require people who are trained on the job. However, if you want the breakthroughs, if you want stuff where people have to become creative and people have to use their brains in order to get the things done, uh, then I think uh, PhD is still a required thing. You don't really have an alternate for a PhD. Right. So, yeah, so that is as far as industries are concerned. So I have actually been talking to lots of industry folks over the last uh, few months. I've written to a large number of them. And most of them have essentially said that they would, you know, when they hire for slightly higher positions, they typically take, uh, you know, PhDs. And they have given me a list of things that they think are important, you know, in the context of life science kind of researches. And yeah. most of it, uh, you know, are stuffs that you actually learn during your PhDs, not stuffs that you learn prior to that. Prior to that. And as far as academic research is concerned, yeah, I don't think there is an option for, uh, there is uh, an alternative for a PhD. So is it about the duration that you spent four, five, six years on a topic, basically immersing yourself? Or is it about a one-to-one -one relationship with your advisor that you are you are kind of a uh, apprentice uh, under a person who is an expert. What exactly it is about PhD that shapes people in, in ways different than any other training? See, till MSc, you have a syllabus, okay? And you are simply learning what other people have deemed to be important. Hmm. And that's about it. And you are going and passing your exams. That's about it. Yeah. There is no independent creative stuff happening till that point in education. Some people might be doing it on their own. Yeah. You know, like you, you were doing during your undergrad. That's a different ballgame. Yeah. But there is no other avenue for people to become creative prior to that. Yeah. It is only during a PhD when you have a problem, you have to solve it. And you have to solve it in whatever way needed. Okay. If you have to learn programming for that, you learn that. If you have to learn, uh, you know, bioinformatics or some other tools, you have to do it. Uh, it's, it doesn't matter how you do it. You have to do it. And until and unless people get trained in that particular aspect, you can't really expect them to become independent researchers. So PhD is the first time when you are trained to become independent. And you yes. go from dependence to independence. And it is precisely for that reason that I said that PhD doesn't really have an alternative. Okay. And the same thing uh, holds for PhD thesis? See, again, a PhD thesis is essentially an institutional requirement. Hmm. In an ideal world, you should have some kind of a scenario where the PhD guide should be able to say, okay, now this person has become truly independent. Now this person has truly become a scholar and now this person is capable of going independent. Yeah. But since a PhD has to be done within a framework, an academic framework, therefore you need to you know, have certain checks and balances and certain boxes to be yeah. ticked, etc. And a thesis is just one of those boxes. Right. A formal, you know, instead of an exam, a formal endpoint to the apprenticeship. Yeah. And how do you think about, uh, you know, the the pressure to publish during PhD? So I'll give you an example. Like you know, there was a time when, uh, I mean, nobody was thinking about a publication at the master's level, right? Uh, it was during your PhD uh, that you started working on real independent research. And even then, a lot of cases, you will complete your PhD without publishing and you will later you know, work on those papers uh, to submit and, you know, uh, to get them reviewed and published finally. 
And a lot of time, your early postdoc years, you would spend publishing articles uh, from your PhD. And things have changed. Uh, now you will not get a admission to graduate school, at least uh, where I am. Uh, uh, if you don't have publications during your bachelor's and master's, uh, right? So if if you have you if you need papers for entrance to a graduate school, then uh, and same thing applies for postdocs. Uh, it's very hard to find a comp competitive postdoc especially in fields where you need infrastructure, you need like much bigger research support compared to theoretical and in more philosophical fields. Uh, if you don't have uh, big publications, you know, the, the so-called high back factor journals during your PhD, um, it doesn't matter what author you are, it doesn't matter how much you have learned, but those publications speak for you. Speak for you. Uh, so, so how do you think, how do you see uh, PhD changing in, uh, you know, from, from those perspectives? See, it's like the rest of your education. Yeah. Okay. Education, I have always believed, serves two parallel purposes and often yeah. these purposes are at loggerheads with each other. Yeah. One purpose is, you know, becoming a better person, acquiring certain skills, acquiring the ability to think, etc. And the other part is pure administrative. The other part is pure, you know, adding more and more points to your yeah. CV. Mm -hmm. So you need the second function because end of the day, when an educated person at any level, bachelor's or master's or PhD, when that person is going to function in the society, yeah. that person will have to function as a member of the, you know, of a certain cadre, a workforce yeah. within the societal framework. Right. And in order to function within that societal framework, you need certain cards. Okay. Right. You need certain whatever titles or whatever you call them. Yeah. And that for that purpose to be served, you require all those things, the papers, the grades, the, you know, whatever other, the conference attendance certificates and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, in an ideal world, these two things should be completely separated out from each other. Yeah. But as of this moment, in our present day society, we do not have a way of separating these two things out. And unfortunately, there is a massive supply demand mismatch. Mm -hmm. The supply of PhDs, the supply of master's students is far, far greater than the number that can be gainfully employed. So the moment this mismatch happens, obviously the administrative part becomes more critical in terms of you know finding a home for these people yeah and when that happens uh, you know stuffs like that you have to have a paper during your masters yeah you have to have two papers during your masters if you you have to have a cell and a nature paper during your masters all these things are going to just go up yeah okay they are simply a symptom of the situation right. that we have far many more phds than we know what to do with and how did that happen? I mean, we have shortage of engineers and doctors uh, and we have access of PhDs. Like even though in PhDs, government have to invest than actually getting money from the students, uh, uh, just like engineering. And so how did that happen? Because, well, it happened primarily because the guesses that were made about how many PhDs are going to be needed has, uh, you know, not kept or rather has outpaced the number of jobs that have been created for them. Okay. So see, whenever, as I was talking uh, some time back, whenever you create these infrastructures, you need to make proper plans, right? You need to have some guesstimate of yeah. how many, you know, positions are going to be created of a certain time, of a certain yeah. type. And therefore you need to, do your things accordingly. You need to make sure that the number that you are creating, the number of positions that you are creating is commensurate with the number of uh, people who are coming out. Right. And uh, once that calculation, you know, it's like any other factory, right? Yeah. A factory which is making things at a rate faster than it is selling them. Right. Will have a massive stockpile. Stock. Yeah. A pile and uh, is the same set of problems. That's right. It. Nothing more. So we have basically bad PR as well as bad economics and science going on. 
<laughs> it's probably a bit of both. Yes, I agree. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, so, so in that case, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think this pyramid scheme of uh, of running a lab has contributed to that? Like, you do your PhD, you become an expert, you do your postdoc, learn some more skills, you became an independent faculty, and now the advice you get or the pressure for you is to just sit and apply for grants, keep writing grants, and basically don't do any bench work or do, do research yourself. Because now your job suddenly becomes to manage uh, and a training environment, basically. So what? So if you look at what is happening in the in the broad schema, is the academic environment is becoming a training environment and a research environment. Because by the time you are trained, you are starting you you start to train somebody else, and your job is to get funding. So it's a perpetual training machine, rather than you actually, uh, you know, like senior people actually on the bench and doing research themselves. Or, or even like more actively involved in research, that that seldom yes. happens. Yeah. Yes, and that partly has to do with the nature of your work. So mm -hmm. if your work involves a lot of consumables, so basically a lot of requirement for funding. Yeah. Then who is the person who is the most suitable for going and getting that funding? Yeah. It's probably yeah. going to be the PI, right? Yeah. At the same time, look at other areas where the amount of funding needed is much less. Or where the people, you know, can do a lot of their own work. I mean, look at the mathematicians, for example. Yeah, they don't have pyramids. Yeah, they they just don't have pyramids, no. and that is because of the nature of their own work. I mean, every single mathematician yeah. that I know of, they all of them have their own projects, and yes. they are actively working on them. And at the same time, they are helping their students to work on their own projects. Right. right. So I think it's a question of which kind of science you are doing, what is your requirement. And if you want to do that kind of science, and if you have that requirement, then how do you plan to solve it? Right. And there are some people who are happy becoming scientific managers. Hmm. There are some other people who are not happy becoming scientific managers. You know, they want the action. They want to be yeah. on the bench. They want to be you know, more hands-on with it. Right. And I know both kinds of people. Yeah. So everybody has to find their own equilibrium. Right. There's no other solution. But there's a huge cost to yourself in getting involved in things, right? Yes. You because will have that much less time to write grants. Yeah. And you'll be much less competitive as per your CV, you know. See, end of the day, yeah. everybody has to figure out what on earth do they want. Okay. As uh, Professor Raghavinder Gadakkar, one of our top evolutionary biologists says, yeah. you know, I spend, therefore I am. Yes. So there are several people who actually believe it's, in that. It's, it's, it's so interesting that sometimes I go to these uh, events or like talks and host uh, and the guest is introduced like he has overseen or she has overseen 12 millions of funding so far. Uh, not even talking about one major finding from their labs. Uh, that's how they're introduced. And to me, I was, I've, you know, I, I, my, I put my economic hat and I was like, uh, I would think like, okay, so they spent $12 million and like three findings compared to somebody who did not spend it all and had so many breakthroughs. So probably that person is a better scientist, right? Uh, but that doesn't happen both in your CV uh, as well as, uh, you know, in general, uh, in the sociology of science these days. Yeah. I mean, so of course you are in, if you are in that particular, you know, spend there for I am mode, yeah. your success is entirely thought of in terms of how much money you have attracted. Right. And of course, very economically speaking, yeah. if you have attracted 12 million, then that means whatever point X into 12 is how much you have given back to your uh, college or your university as overheads. Right. So you are that much of a more productive person for your... Oh, university. I see. So so you're productive. So it's like beauty lies in the eyes of a beholder. So who, who is the beholder here? Exactly. Like, who's exactly. the beneficiary? So exactly. the beneficiary is no more public. The beneficiary is no more your students. The beneficiary is, is university administration. Yes, but they are the ones who are sitting on your uh, promotion uh, meeting, right? Right. Yeah, that's where the incentives are. That's what the evolutionary thinking does for you, right? It yeah. always makes you think where the incentives are. Where yeah. is it that the fitness is being optimized? So the system is now selecting for grant writers, basically. We are we are selecting scientists for grantsmanship and not for science. 
the yes. evolutionary pressure has shifted, right? In in the in in the domain of science. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. In in organized research of the kind that is being conducted in most high profile institutes and universities, yes, yes that's what has happened. Right. Okay. So we're really... paying the price. Hmm. Oh, yeah, of course you're paying the price at the cost of uh... Uh, uh, I think we have diminishing returns for that reason. Well, see, again, it depends on which returns are you looking at. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm going from a different, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being a different beholder exactly. here. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You are a different beholder. Right. Do you think it's a it's a function of a, a kind of a limited pie that you have only this much of research funding, so every university wants to grab as bigger a pie of that? Uh, and, and that's why... That is always going to be there, right? Yeah. In which universe are you going to get infinite funding for in a given country or in a given system? Yeah. So that will always be there. Uh, I think what is happening is that people are selecting for the so-called super chickens. Okay. They are simply saying that, okay, these are the people who are getting us 90% of the revenue so let us put all our funds in them and yeah. not care too much about the remaining 10%. And where do you think this ends? Uh, like like how far how far is it sustainable in China? Uh, or where would we uh, start changing things? Like there will be a societal or institutional... Uh... I don't know when we will start changing things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard, you know, when the entire society is behaving in a certain way, then how does one even think of those yeah. alternatives? Right. Um, see, I think there will always be a fringe which will say that we are not playing this game. Yeah. We are playing the game by our own rules. And the whole question will be, at which point will this fringe have a sufficiently high fitness advantage such that they will try to become the mainstream? Okay. Okay. And honestly, I cannot predict when this is going to happen. As of this moment, I don't see this happening. Yeah. Or rather, I'm seeing, you know, it will probably end up happening when uh, there is a massive dismantling of uh, the present uh, research ecosystem. But if there is a massive dismantling of the present research ecosystem, then the societal costs of that are going to be mind-blowing. Right. Because research is not only sustaining the, you know, the PIs and their PhD students, there are, there's a huge amount of, you know, stuff, activity happening around them. Yes. All the support staffs, all yeah. the vendors, all the makers of the consumables. All Conferences. The the yeah. Conferences. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the entire research ecosystem. And yeah. when I say research, I don't only mean scientific research. I mean, academic research right, in general. Right, right. The entire academic research system has a huge number of people right. depending on them. The system is too big to fail. Yes. Too big to so, fail. And when you have a system which is too big to fail, then of course, changing that system becomes that more difficult. That yeah. much more difficult. So, but 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 the fringe has always been trying to say to change the system, right? No matter what the system was historically, right? I think so, I think the fringe always tr tries to exist. To ex okay, okay, okay. <laughs> fringe I, I, tries to I agree with you. I, that's a better formulation. Yes, yeah, yes. right. That's how they express themselves, uh, changing the system. But they are always trying to exist. Yes, yes, and yeah. they, you know, obviously they are always on the lookout for. Yes some kind of a change. Yeah. And when that happens, uh, you know, when they get the opportunity, they try to grab it. Right. I think they have very high cortisol levels in general. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you never know when you are eaten. <laughs> yes. Right. They are, they are carnivores around. So, yeah. So, uh, and so I, I was recently kind of trying to figure out a couple of things and it seems like the open source publishing movement, which started with, with with this good faith of things being available to people. Now, when you look at uh, publication houses, uh, especially some making these high impact open source publications, uh, it seems like it's very much tied to the funding ecosystem. So in the sense that if you can, if you as a publisher can identify, okay, these are the areas in which we have massive public funding, 
and there are public mandates to be to, to be publishing science which is available to public for free of cost then this is where we can start some high impact factor journals and the publishing cost would be paid by you know the funding agencies uh, via through through pis uh, and you can start a journal and suddenly it will just take over almost everything else and you will have massive impact factors and massive publication fees right so the whole uh, economy of science is kind of also shaping around the funding uh, yes. uh, patterns rather than uh, anything else and a lot of good faith ideas are basically uh, in the mask of those good faith ideas i feel it's the same uh, same ecosystem thriving yeah no see this open access thing yeah. per se i like the open access system yeah but what i don't understand is the open access fee that is being charged yes because in the current era of digital publication yes the cost of publishing an article is actually pretty low right pretty 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 low and yeah. there are excellent estimates of what those costs are yes right everybody knows what server costs are yes. everybody yes. knows how much you are paying your uh, whichever editorial assistant or managerial yeah. person that you have hired etc yeah. so the cost per article is actually not a secret at all right under that situation i yeah. seriously don't understand why is it that the publishers are getting away with charging this yes. humongous open access fee okay right. i do understand yeah. they are getting away with it because there are several funding agencies which have mandated yes you have to publish in a open access journal and i will give you the fee right okay now obviously such funding agencies are funding a handful of people yes and exactly happen to all those guys who are not getting funded by those funding so agencies. exactly so if you do not have funds right now and no matter how good your science and how good breakthroughs you are doing you will not get exposure because the journals like for myself sometimes i look for how many journals i can publish now they're shrinking uh despite the number of journals is increasing the journals in which i can publish is shrinking because yes. a lot of those society journals are dying a lot of yes. those you know non open access journals are also dying or reducing in in any kind of impact and now you have this burgeoning uh, open source uh, open source open access economy which is charging you uh, a head and a leg i mean if you are paying eleven thousand uh, dollars just to get a PDF, uh, you know, which you can do it on Overleaf, right? The the documents I create in Overleaf are as good quality with DOIs and links as you know, for example, uh, Springer and Elsevier or or any like PLOS or any any publication house publishes, right? They're pretty competitive. So uh, that's basically uh, four months of uh, stipend uh, for a graduate student or uh, or three months mm -hmm. for a postdoc. Right. And you translate it into the economy, you know, uh, purchasing power parity of an Indian student yeah. or an African student. You exactly. understand where it is. Yes. Goes. So if 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 you as a faculty from India are paying, uh, let's say, ten thousand dollar open access fee, just like two <laughs> PhD students for uh, for a whole one year, basically, like two PhD students for a year. So how much exactly. research output they will produce, and how much good fun, you know, good stuff they'll produce, like compared to this one PDF, right? No, sometimes I feel if yeah. all the funding agencies of the world yeah. come together, okay, yeah. because most of the funding agencies are either governmental, yeah, or, or non these are you know or non profits. So yeah. everybody comes together and comes up with a value, okay, yeah. say something like hundred dollars or fifty dollars, yeah, okay, which is based on some calculation of how much it actually costs to get a paper published. Right. Given that you know all the editors are working for free, given that all the reviewers are working for free, yeah, just figure out how much it costs and add some extra profit, five percent, ten percent. So what yeah. you know looks like a reasonable profit to that, yeah. and say that yes, all journals should you know all stuffs funded by us have to be published in open access journals. Yeah, and any open access journal which charges more than say twenty yeah. dollars fee, it cannot be published in that. Yeah. Overnight, things will change. Yes. Overnight, things will change. Yes. Overnight. Yeah. And how much more, more money would be there to fund even more younger PIs and young graduate students? How much more problems yes. we will solve with that money? Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Right. I mean, right. I also don't understand. You know, I yeah. think this is a perfect time for governments of the world to take over uh, scientific publication. Right. 
okay all yeah. governments have their you know all nations have their science science academies yeah okay let certain science academies come together and yeah. say here we have come together we are going to publish these eight or ten or whatever eight hundred journals yeah this is the amount of money and we are going to either not charge anything yeah or if we charge we will charge only this much right and yeah. everything is automatically going to be open access period right. yes okay let instead of funding these uh, you know stupid journals or yeah. the, you know publishing houses let uh, the funders directly fund these journal guys right these kind of journals or okay. you, you, are running... you or you publish your pdfs at the funding agency's website i mean i mean nobody has risk no 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 so the point over there is the peer review and the editorial betting that goes on that is needed okay. because that in some sense is the assurance of the quality no but of course we can do it open and we can still publish it they can host it at the website right like this is the money hmm. so even now funding agencies have these papers on their website right like if nih has funded you have it at pubmed right so hmm. if i can right now get my article published on pubmed where i have to put all the details and the figures and it finally gets a pmid and pmc id uh you can actually have peer reviewed done and once a peer reviewed is approved you can have it published and pubmed why do we need to go to like a publication house and then when it's published then we upload it on pubmed right we can have that's it that's another possibility right? that's a, i mean it's a model that needs to be explored right. but i'm sure something right. some variant of that can be done the infrastructure is already there it's not it publishing is not like a like a big i mean i remember when bio archive started Uh, I think you were named by Bio Archive as the person who submitted the most, or among the few who submitted <laughs> I, I the most preprints. Number th- number Three. third on the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you were a very early adopter of uh, of archiving, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right, and and for example, right now I have preprints on ResearchGate. They have already have seven to eight hundred views. So almost everyone I wanted to to read that paper has read. So now publication is more like a formality. That okay, yeah. Uh, now you can cite it, you know, with a with a journal name. Uh, and, and not much it adds. Uh, no, I'll not chain. be. I'll not be that uh, harsh. So, yeah. for example, I think some of the things that happens is that the publications make sure that the data files are submitted. Yeah. Okay. The supplementary right. files are, you know, in a way that they can be uh, downloaded by going to the appropriate DOI, yeah. etc. So. Yeah. if suppose you know all that is put on research gate or all that yeah. is put on bio archive it will become too difficult for those guys to maintain it right, right? yeah so i'm i think the journals are performing a good function yeah. but the cost at which most of them yeah, are exactly. operating is yeah. it, it's, it it's just too, doesn't add up right and just the submitting i mean there's a recent estimate that this changing formats of articles while submitting and the uploading process there's a 200 million dollar yearly cost of just that time wasted when you go from one journal to the other so i still wonder why there has not been any standardization or at least policies that you can submit the way you want which some journals have have used so far but still uh, no see the one pickier. one good thing that i saw about it is uh, if you remember when all this open access fight was uh, going on some of the governments of yeah. european nations they simply said nothing doing we are not paying right right okay. at the national level they did that did right. that and i was very happy i thought that was a great thing and that is the only way to do this right okay yeah. i think this is one thing on which nations can in general agree yeah because it you know everybody is in science equally yeah so i think uh, as you know entire humanity coming together yeah we should just stamp this out forever forever yeah yes and make sure that everything gets accept you uh, know accessible to entire humanity in perpetuity period right. it's it's so interesting otherwise right like public is funding science and we as scientists who want we actually want public to fund more science we want a greater proportion of gdp to spent in science uh, but at the same time public does not have access i mean uh, like when i'm at home or i don't have uh, institutional access uh, it's mind boggling because uh, for others to read one of my papers is like $37 $39 $45 uh, just to read no. a pdf Mad- madhur yeah. you have no idea you know how things have changed compared yeah. to our times okay and yeah. i'm not too old okay yes. so when i was around yeah it all depended so sahib was not there lipchen was not there right, okay right 
So, research gate was not there. Academic research gate was not there. Nothing was yeah. bioarchive was not yeah. there. Okay, archive was there, but then bio papers were not put up on archive. Yes, yes. So for us, getting access to papers yeah. was such a huge thing, and I was near to IISC, which had one of, the, and I had access to IISC, which had one of the best subscriptions in the whole country. Yeah. In spite of that, I was feeling stifled in a big wave simply because there were so many journals that even IISC could not afford to access. Right. And think about somebody sitting in some corner of this country where they yeah. don't have access to some place like IISC. I mean, that person will probably get hold of an article right. after one month, two months, and God knows how much time. Right. It was unthinkable. And um, no, okay, I agree that from a legal point of view, ethical, moral, whatever, you know, people have issues with Sahihab and Lipchen and all that. But as far as practicing scientists are concerned, particularly in uh, developing nations, these services, along with ResearchGate and BioArchive, have been the great leveler. Right. Okay. They are the ones which have changed the way we do science right. compared to people sitting in the first world. Right. And, uh, no, even in the first world, if you look at institutional cost, I mean, if you hmm. if you start a new institute right now, like you won't be able to do research. I mean, even if you have the capacity, unless you pay this huge subscription cost and they run hmm. in like tens of millions of dollars a year. I know, I know, I know. I mean, I'm part of ISER Pune, which is supposed to be one of the premier institutes of the country. Yeah. And when I look at the bill, yeah. of you know library subscriptions i'm like oh my goodness this yes. is a crime yeah and that is happening when icer is part of a major consortium and right. the entire bargaining is happening at the consortium level yeah. you bring the price down as much as one can and so on and so forth right not all universities of the country are part of this consortium so right. they are not getting those accesses so yes you know it's a scam science scientific publication is a massive scam yeah. Yes. And I don't care what all those publishing houses would like to say. Yeah. You know, this this has to stop at some point. And the sooner it stops, the better it will be for the society and better it will be for the confidence that the society has on the you know, scientific institution. No, I think I think uh, to a certain extent, as much as I was like talking about like uh, societal acceptance on science, scientists by uh, silent themselves in multiple ways and gatekeeping also have brought a lot of what to themselves. I mean, not science generally, like scientists themselves, but things which they were supposed to oppose for, but they never opposed, right? Uh, like? like publishing, like for example, uh, science as a community went along with this kind of publication model for such a long time. Yes, they yeah. did. But again, you know, it came down to the incentives, right? Yeah. It came down all to the incentives because the moment you have this kind of structured impact you know, factor. Impact, Exactly. So let's talk, let's talk. Let's talk. So let's talk about impact factor. Okay. So 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 I mean, for those who don't know what exactly is impact factor and how does it affect you, like how how had impact factor affected you? I know you had a paper in science, for example, right? So you are definitely a beneficiary of, uh, uh, have, you know, I have so, to accept it. Publishing a high impact journal, right? And that made you a celebrity as well. So that I don't know whether it would be a celebrity or not, but I mean, yeah. from the eyes of the beholder, you know, I'm talking about from some beholder's perspective. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you think of impact factors? Uh, like, do they have any relevance and what are they? I mean, technically speaking, you know what they are. It's a measure yeah. of, you know, how many times citation your papers or papers in that particular journal yeah. are being cited yeah. within a particular uh, frame of time. Yeah. But per se, I think the entire scientific world understands that they mean nothing. Yeah. They are just another metric. Yeah. And as far as the predictive power of that metric is concerned, studies after studies have shown that uh, the predictive power of that for anything is very poor. Very poor, yes. So yeah, it exists. It exists. It's, and yeah. And and it's it's I mean, and 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 you would think that given this understanding and the pre-printing culture it will reduce but it has not reduced i mean in fact during covid during covid uh with inflating other things inflating impact for factors also inflated for like a lot of journals yes they, because they, impact factor is often being used yeah. as a proxy by many people for quality yeah if this article is published in a whatever impact factor 25 journal yeah. then it must be better than another article which has been published in an impact factor 20 or an impact factor 15 journal yeah Nobody reads the article. Right. So you just. And nobody cites that, yeah. 
No, citation is a different ball game altogether because see, citation is something that only people in your narrow field can do. Yeah. No, but okay. still, you get a citation run if you are in a high impact factor, right? I mean, you are more likely <laughs> it comes uh, on the top on Google search. So algorithmically, it is privileged once you are in a high impact factor that drift towards more uh, exposure. I mean, I know what you're saying is right. Yeah. Okay. I'm not disputing that. Yeah. But at the same time, if people who are working in your field yeah. are unable to distinguish between what is a high quality paper and mm -hmm. what is a low quality paper and yeah. are resorting to the journal where it is being published as a proxy of that, yeah. then your field has a big problem to begin with. Of course. Of okay. course. And yeah. having said that, I'll be the first guy to appreciate that this is true of most fields. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's unfortunate, but that's how things are. Right. I mean, nowadays, most people are doing their scientific reading on Twitter. How much worse can it get? I, right? okay, and, I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something that I'm getting from lots of people. Yeah. So you know that I'm on Twitter, but you also know that I hardly go to Twitter. Hmm. Okay, I only yeah. go there, you know, once in a while, particularly if I have to say, you know, Right. publish some link or something otherwise i don't care about yeah. going to twitter but many people around me they tell me that look if you are not there on twitter how on earth are you going to know the latest advances in your area and i'm like in order to know the latest advances in my area i subscribe to journal uh, you know alerts that's how yeah. you are supposed to know how what the latest advances are right but in but according to them, uh, journal alerts have you know so much of information. Who has the time? So Twitter gives you these nice packaged things, right? Hmm. And nowadays, there are lots of AIs where you upload a PDF and they will give you a one para summary of the paper. And uh -huh. you know, there is so much of excitement about those. And I've been asking people, boss, that's what an abstract is supposed to do, right? Yeah, right, right, right. That, that's that's what I was wondering. Uh, so yeah. now, now after abstract, some journals have the author summary as well, you know, which is a shorter, more lay, lay language summary of your and abstract. And there are some journals which are, have bullet points called highlights. Right, and they also want a graphical abstract now. <laughs> and then there's a graphical abstract. Yeah. So that is I mean, right. how much more do you have to go? Or, yeah. or is it that end of the day, everything will boil down to home? Everything is home. <laughs> One <laughs> Let us one sound. Right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. It might be, it might be some syllable. You know, so can you condense <laughs> it syllable. the syllable and share that yes. syllable? You know, <laughs> right. It so really, really becomes crazy. So I mean, that's like skipping the titles, right? Basically, I mean, reading on Twitter, it's it's not it's not more than that. Yes, but lots of people are doing it. I mean, no, who I'm like? Not... Who, I mean, who, which people are you talking about? Like PhD uh, like... students, postdocs, and even faculty. Okay. And by the way, let me tell you, yeah. there are journals which are giving, you know, long instructions, yeah. five, six page or longer instructions to people about how to tweet about your recently published paper. Okay. Okay. Take all the figures. You yeah. Know, your first tweet should say this, your second tweet should say that, and then you know, talk about each figure and then write about each figure, then write about how the whole thing is coming together. So, why do we have publications? Like, why why can't Twitter start a journal? You know what? That yeah. probably is where the whole thing is going. Right? Yeah. So I think what it will boil down to yeah. is you write your paper because yes. somebody has to review it, right? Right. You write your paper, the entire thing gets reviewed. Yeah. Then the whole thing will essentially go into supplementary online material. Yeah. Your actual paper and your supplementary online material. Right. And then what will be there on the website will be these tweets. Yes. You know, 10 tweets, which will also be put up on Twitter. Right, right, right. So tweets, if, yeah. If you think about it, if hmm. you think about the average length of a science or a nature article. Yeah. Isn't this Pretty much what they're doing. Yeah, the so I, that, article is what two thousand five hundred words. Yes, and the supplementary material is like forty pages, sixty pages. Right. <laughs> and that is what I wanted to discuss with you. Like, so, so me as I'm going deeper and deeper into my work, I like to write longer manuscripts with like a full historical. Like, I want to build introduction. And my collaborator, my long-term collaborator, Damien, he 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 loves writing long articles as well uh, to give almost all the information required to make the case. Right. And then as many details about the methods and analysis, 
and discuss uh, the results in every possible way, right? That's how basically hypothesis testing work, yes. uh, right? And if we and 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 most journals are putting, even though they are online now, it's like PDF should have unlimited space, but more <laughs> and more word limits are coming in, right? Yes. Like more and more journals. So yes. to an extent that recently there was one article I I was not able to publish, so now I'm converting that into, that into a book, which might be coming next year. Uh, it has gone that you know the length limitations have gone to that extent, right? Why do you think that's the case? I mean, how would a like who reads the supplementary? Who reviews the supplementary? You can hide in almost anything in the supplementary. So yes. so how so first of all we are losing on credibility because. Uh, yeah, basically, it's like going to somebody's house and every, you, you know, like all the dust is below the bed and like it's a pretty dirty place, you know, but but it looks cool because all the dirt has been pushed, you know, uh, below the furniture, right? That's what basically it is. Uh, so who is yes. gaining, like, how, how does it help and how does it help anyone? <clears throat> no, so from what I understand, yeah. everybody is thinking about the broad readership. Okay. Yeah. And you know this term, right? Right, right. Most Your paper is rejected because, uh, because it's not suitable for the for broad broader readership. readership. Yeah, I yeah. never understood yeah. this. And it's 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 very specific. <laughs> it's very subject oriented, and uh, yes. you would wonder like if you are not subject, so who is the subject? Then? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But I think what they are really trying to say yeah. is that. I mean, this is my guess, okay? Yeah. Uh, I am not getting this from anyone. Yeah. My guess is what they're really trying to say is that, hey, look, if you write something that big, yeah. nobody is going to read it. And if they are not going to read it, they're not going to cite it. Yeah. If they're not going to cite it, then think about our impact factor, which end of the day is what the journal's you know reputation and how much it can charge people is built on. So that is right. their incentive, building up their impact factor. Yeah. So I think what the journals are trying to do, at least that is what their incentive is going to be, yeah. is towards publishing stuffs that is easily accessible to people yeah. as much as practicable. And that actually has as many, you know, hooks to as many areas as possible. Right. That's what makes it quote unquote broad. Yeah, but right. the AI tools, they can easily do that, right? You write manuscript of your length and when somebody reads, they can select like, I want a 500 word summary, I want a 1000 word summary, 1500 word summary, I want to read the full article. <laughs> that solves that issue. And that is precisely what's going to happen. That's what I said, right? The entire yeah. article will go into supplement Yeah. and either the author generated or the AI generated summary is what the paper is going to be, which will be not more than 100 or maybe 500 words. That's it. Okay. So essentially, all journals will become like abstract books. Complex, yeah. Complex. Yeah, abstract books. Yeah, yeah, abstract you know, books, yeah. In conferences, you have those, right? Yeah, yeah. So abstract books with one nice graphical thing to excite you. So I think engineering disciplines were advanced. They were always looking, they always had like these short two-page papers. <laughs> <laughs> they knew that's where future will be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Right, right, right. It, it, it's interesting. So... Yeah. Engineering uh, guys, I thought they pri primarily published in proceedings, right? No, they published proceedings, but proceedings generally tend to be much. Uh, I mean, for all the developments in technology, there's there's a lot of noise and quality issues in proceedings. Like I have only one proceeding. Uh, it was it was one subject data. It went and the 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 review recommendations are basically suggestive. You don't need to incorporate them, and oh. it's it's basically like for the most part, proceedings are like junk. Uh, as oh, per my experience, I yeah, I didn't know that. I've never published yeah. in proceedings. I mean, yeah. conference proceedings kind of things. I, I mean, in published. certain fields, it makes sense. Like AI, for example, or computer science, things are at so the developments are happening at such a high pace that you don't have time for peer review. Like, mm. like for example, some of our papers have been in review. We discussed for like six months. You can't afford that in AI and computer science with that pace of development. The text. Actually, yeah. actually, okay. What I'm saying is anecdotal. I heard that at one point, uh, developments in CRISPR were yeah. so fast that people who were working at the cutting edge they were no longer publishing it uh, in papers. They were yeah. simply updating their websites. Yeah, quite quite fast. And this happened during pandemic as well, COVID as well, right? Like okay. archiving, archiving became a main thing and and getting cited. A lot of people oh. who were opposed to archives, citing archives, they cited hmm. archives left and right because there was no other option. 
Right. No, but that was, at least it was going up to archive. So at least a paper was getting written. Yes. Yes, Here yes. they're not, apparently what I heard is they were not even writing it. They were just uploading, uploading their, you know, figures right. and whatever. It was quite possible. It, it, it was a gold rush. So uh, nobody wants to be left behind I, here. I, I'm not so sure about, you know, your harshness about uh, conference proceedings because I have spoken to engineers in certain areas and um, primarily... No, no, they are, they are good ones as well. But what I'm saying hmm. is that they also have a similar kind of, they also have quality issues. In fact, sometimes more than journals. Because there are a lot of proceedings. Quality well. quality issues will be there everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So that's fine. As long as the right. core is fine, it's okay. Yeah. So, sir, uh, what do you think about the... So, so basically, do you think that all this boils down to impact factor, that one number is dictating all this game? And if we get rid of impact factor, then the length limitations will go away. Like, it will just solve all the issues. Look, you have to get rid of matrix. Yeah. And... You cannot get rid of all the metrics because end of the day, yeah. when you are thinking of science as a profession, yeah. when you are thinking of tenure, when you are thinking of promotion, right. at all those places, metrics are going to come in. Right. Because nobody really has the time to look at, read all the papers that a person has written, think yeah. about them, chat with the person for three, four hours and you know, forming a qualitative judgment. Yeah. That's one point. Right. The second point is, see, qualitative judgments by their very definition are qualitative. Right. So obviously, one person's qualitative judgment is going to be different from another person's qualitative judgment. And therefore, it is entirely possible that two people who are reviewing the same application package, one person will say this is garbage and the other person will say this is brilliant. Right. And therefore, that is where comes in the objectivity or almost, you know, fetishization of objectivity in yeah. today's Yeah. The problem is quality cannot be objectively measured. It, yeah. It's a fundamental thing, right? Right, right. And therefore, but the point is administrators, they need to save their precious backside. Yeah. So they will insist on some kind of objective uh, measures. I like that, precious backside. And, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably that's the most precious thing they have. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so yeah so that that's when so if you get rid of impact factor some other other uh, metric yeah. will come h index or whatever you know, it's so interesting that uh, how we make decisions in our personal lives like for example our spouses of course i'm not in a state to, to talk about you know the spousal choices or you know i've lost that uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that right but uh, people make subjective choices right we don't look for like okay this is their height this is your width this is your weight and or whatever these are your number of publications or whatever you know like we it's it's yeah people look at salaries and people look at a little you know some this and that but but still it's like a very high dimensional space in which they're looking or judging a person at least the dimensions are right pretty so, large so pretty large like huge number of dimensions they are they are looking for uh, in a spouse and and people like me make a mistake only when uh, most often when they reduce the number of dimensions and end up making those decisions. So, do you think uh, uh, that the problem is not the impact factor of one of those factors, but maybe we are actually judging or rating people on very low number of dimensions? It's the it's a dimensionality issue and not actually a metric issue. No. See, so the problem is that you are right. We are judging on a low number of dimensions, but why are we judging on a low number of dimensions? Because yeah. The cost of judging on high, higher number of dimensions is much higher. Okay. Hmm. So as I said, suppose an application package has come to me for review. Okay. An application package for a faculty to get tenure or for getting promotion. Yeah. Now, in an ideal world, what all am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to read through every paper that the person has published. Yeah. I'm supposed to try to understand, get some kind of a feeling for what the person has actually achieved and what the person has not achieved. Right. Then I'm supposed to look at all the other things that are given in the application package in yeah. terms of how much grants, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Then I'm supposed to weigh that by the situation where the person you know, right. finds himself or herself. 
Okay. So obviously somebody whose package has come from a well-endowed place versus yeah. a person whose package has come from a not so well-endowed place, I have to judge them differently. Right, right. Correct. And ideally, I should be given a chance to talk to that person yeah. for two, three, four hours to get an idea of where this person is as a scientist, as an academic, what all right. that person has achieved. Okay, I should right. look at their teaching, you know, in case it's a teaching institute, and yeah. I should go through all the teaching evaluation to get an idea of what kind of a teacher this person is. Right. And then I should integrate all this in my head and then come up with a report. Yeah. And end of that, I'm supposed to make a very simple binary thing. Yes, yeah. promote this person or no, don't promote this person. Right. Correct. Yeah. How much time do you think this will take for me? And yeah, a lot of time. Exactly. And also, you will you will be prone to litigation as well, right? I think litigation that, is also part of things. That's, yeah. that's, that's a second. Yeah. That's a big problem. Okay? Right. Everything is you know prone to litigation these days. Yes. But the point is, as a reviewer, yeah. What incentive do I have? Right. Yeah. It's it's service basically. Yeah. It is a service. Yeah. It is a service. But at the end of it, I know that if I end up doing a good job, yeah. I am essentially opening myself up to potential litigation. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now think about the administrator yeah. who is sitting at the institute. Yeah. And he has to take he or she has to take the final decision. Yeah. Okay. What have they got in front of them? They have got in front of them five or six different reviews. Yeah. If they are lucky, all of them are in one direction. Yeah. But typically, what will happen is some will say, "Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is great." Some will say, "No, no, that not that great." And some people will be somewhere in the middle. Right. So the person has to now integrate over this entire thing. Right. Okay, that person is in an even greater danger of getting. Uh, so, sued. but why do we have administrators making this decision? Why don't we give this decision to scientists themselves? No, no. When I say administrator yeah i mean the corresponding deans okay. or okay. heads of not a babu okay okay yeah so but the point is that again the person has to make this decision right and that again takes time hmm. and that person is probably you know he or she has to decide on 10 such cases within right, two or right. three days right where is the incentive right there's none so, yeah. exactly and there is a lot of disincentive, by the way. Yes, yes, suppose, yes, of course. And suppose you end up saying no, yeah. then you have to make a proper case. Right. If you don't make a case, then you know you are dragged to the court. Right. So taken together, objective yeah. metrics, howsoever poor they are, howsoever stupid they are, yeah. you can always say, this was my a priori written and declared metric. This person didn't fulfill it. Yeah. Talk. So, so basically, these, this is like a human condition. So, so not much uh, can be thought. And so, one has in, to completely yeah. rethink about all these stuffs, you know, these promotions, etc., and ask the questions. Uh, yeah. You know, what exactly are we trying to promote? Right. Okay. Yeah. Are we doing it at the individual level, or do we want to do it at the group level? Right. Do we want the entire department to become better, or do we yeah. want one individual to become better? Yes. So, you know, all those group selection versus individual selection. <laughs> exactly. I, that's what I was trying to say. Like, you know, evolutionary thinking helps so much, you know, in, in thinking of these issues. It does. Yeah. Enormously. Yeah. Enormously. Like where to put selection pressure, where not to put, to have yes. enough variance uh, in your population to be able to put the pressure yes. selectively. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And essentially, I mean, uh, I recently gave a talk on this. Yeah. So uh, there is there was this uh, person called William Muir, who was working in Purdue University. Yeah. And he was uh, a chicken geneticist. So basically, mm -hmm. he was trying to improve the breed of chicken, chicken for yeah. laying chicken for laying more eggs. Yeah. So the standard practice in poultry farming is to select the those chickens which lay the maximum number of eggs yeah. and allow them to breed for the next generation and essentially create your stock using those. those. Yeah. So this guy said, okay, let's do it differently. Instead of, you know, selecting the maximum layers, yeah. we create gr groups, okay? And then we select that group, which as a group has led the maximum number of eggs. I see, All of yeah. Them. Right, right, okay. right. And did that for only 
I think four or six generations. That's it. Yeah. Okay. And then compared those with these other super chickens, which have been bred for individual performance. Yeah. So there is a figure that you know I showed the students. It's yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So in one cage, you have twelve chickens, all of them, you know, very healthy, yeah. well feathered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in another cage, you have just three chickens, almost featherless, looking extremely haggard, and you know, for all practical purposes, close to death. You know what has happened? Yeah. Turns out, when you select for increased egg lay, you are also selecting for increased aggressiveness. So. In the super chicken thing, the three birds have essentially pecked everybody else to death. That reminds me of one of the institutions I was in. You know, I was trained. <laughs> you know, uh, during my academic career, uh, at one institution, that's exactly what happens. Yes. 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 Yeah. They have, and the point is, in the process yeah. of doing that, they themselves are in an extremely bad condition. Right. And if you look at the total egg output. Yeah. These uh, other group selected birds, they have a much greater total egg output. I think egg output goes up from 91 eggs per hen to 237 eggs right. per hen. Okay. And then you uh, look at their ability to resist stress. Yes. You look at, uh, you know, many other uh, life history and, and, features. And you can also manipulate other variables like what kind of group size you are selecting for. Ah, those are different right. volumes. Yeah. But this is something that they have shown directly. Yeah. Okay. That when you are selecting for the superstars, you are always, or not always, but in many cases, you are selecting for the meanest and the most aggressive, you know, characters. Yes. And when that happens, yeah. And then you put them in a group. Yeah. They essentially become a big <laughs> eradicate for others. Everybody else. <laughs> and the group overall functioning of the group actually yes, suffers. Yes, and yes. Uh, uh, that's what is called a toxic workplace, basically. <laughs> right, right. right. So, yeah. so, so, how old is this study? Oh, this is a pretty old study. Uh, okay. 90s. Yeah, 90s. So, it must be in the It must have been already incorporated in management principles, right? By now? You know what? People have actually discovered this in management relatively recently. Okay. okay. So, for example, uh, you know, several corporates have yeah. actually figured out. See, in corporates, you get the same thing, right? People yes. who are the best performers, they get all the incentives and everybody else either get fired or right. are actively disincentivized. Yeah. So, they have taken some of the very, very big multinational companies and yeah. they have actually shown that this super chicken business has greatly, greatly impacted their function. And as a result, some of these companies, I think Microsoft is one of them, they have completely changed the way they are doing their, uh, you know, appraisals. Yeah. So there is something called uh, stack something, I forget the precise uh, management term. So that uh, stack evaluation, I think the, that stack evaluation purpose, um, stack evaluation practice has been given up by uh, Microsoft. Right based on this kind of thinking. Another so, reason why evolutionary science should be funded and well-funded. <laughs> I mean, if you, if, you, if you think about it, right, like the, it, it's so much related to uh, human condition and how we, you know, have organization and how we run organizations. Yeah, it is, it is, absolutely. Right. I mean, for like uh, in Indian context, uh, I remember my uncles are, was, were in marketing mm. and uh, voracious readers and they would always read these management books and they were mostly from Western industry, Western uh, academic institutions like Harvard Business School, you know, Chicago Booth and things like that, places like that. Uh, and a lot of those things don't apply uh, that well in Indian context because uh, the demography is different. Uh, you know, we have much more uh, heterogeneity, you know, in, in people and in language and things like that. But we have not developed our own, for example, you know, principles which apply to Indian context as much. Right? You know the weird population thing, right? No. The replication crisis in psychology and the weird population? Uh, I know what the replication... Oh, yeah. You mean that the whole psychology research is psychology undergraduates of Western institutions? Yes, right? because yeah. most, most of those researches were done on Western... Edu uh, on undergrad male students primarily yeah. Yeah. from Western, Indi uh, Western educated, individualistic, 
Uh, I forget what R stands for and D is for develop. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, I remember the, that meme, yes. Yes, so that, yeah, that, that's what weird stands for. Yeah. Yes, weird psychology, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and uh, actually when those were repeated in yes. other cultures, yeah. and in other age groups, etc., most of them uh, don't replicate. Right. Now, much of this uh, marketing you know, strategies, they are yeah. coming from organizational psychology studies, which have been done again in the Western countries right. with a very different mindset. Right. So, yeah, you are right. You take those principles and try to apply them to Indian uh, situation. Right. Yeah, it, it but, doesn't work. Uh, one thing I will slightly differ with you, it's not that uh, we Indians have not uh, developed our own stuff. Okay. So there are several companies. From, most important of them is uh, Hindustan uh, Liver. Unilever. Unilever, yeah. Okay. yeah. Unilever. So uh, those guys actually have a very different concept of uh, management. Okay. So there's a brilliant book called uh, CEO Factory. Okay. okay. So Hindustan Liver, they actually are very different because they have supplied the maximum number of CEOs for Indian industries. Okay. okay. How? So basically... Anybody who joins Hindustan Lever, they have to start from the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that I know about it. It's a very old-fashioned uh, company in that sense. You don't have yes. You don't have suddenly an IIM Ahmedabad graduate coming in to take a top yes. management position, <laughs> which, yes. by the way, we'll come back to that. One of my uncles <laughs> think that the first thing we should do is like shut down MBA institutions. <laughs> I completely agree with your uncle on this. I think yeah. that will solve a lot of problems on yeah. this planet yes. straight away. Yeah. I mean, if you look All at uh, if you look at hmm. Japan, I mean, Japan doesn't have MBA programs like the US has. I mean, look at CEO of Hitachi. You don't hmm. know who CEO of Hitachi is or who CEO of Samsung is, right? But they're still doing good and the companies are big and innovating. But at the same time, you have Western companies where you the CEO is celeb celebrated. And most likely, he has been from like some business school. Basically, they keep parallel, the moving parallel. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, coming I, back I, to I, yeah, yeah, yeah what, So yeah, I interrupted huh. you. Huh. So essentially, what happens is that they, you know, identify the people who they think can become leaders yeah. later, and they groom not one but yeah. a whole cohort of them. Yeah. Okay, and then. You know, all of them are, let's say, just below the, below the CEO level. Yeah. And then when the time comes for succession, one of them becomes the CEO. Right. But the others then, instead of staying back at Unilever, many yeah. of them actually move to other companies. And yeah. apparently these other companies value these Hindustan uh, liver trained people extremely yeah. highly because these people are extremely well grounded and know the stuff very right. well. Right, 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 right. So, so, so that is why each time Hindustan Unilever gets a new CEO, others also get a 10 right, other companies right. with new CEOs because all these other people then, you know, diverge away and basically clear yeah. the niche. Yeah, Hindustan Unilever is that old uh, people ka pair which has its root in all the neighboring houses, you know, they don't know that. So, so like our, our life in India, like everything we consume from morning to evening is like mostly Hindustan Unilever. A good and, fraction. Uh, yes. A good fraction of it. I mean, it's reducing with, with more competition. But a good fraction of it, like from food to, from toothpaste to ice cream, basically. No, I'll heavily recommend this book, CEO Factory. CEO Factory. Very, CEO Factory, very nicely written about, primarily about the philosophy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. How the right. company runs. Yes. And 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 so so is that like, is that a, a common thing to any Unilever uh, uh, subsidiary in any country, or or did they uh, did from they start this? I, in India itself. What I understand, it's India specific. India At specific. least the okay. book doesn't talk about other uh, countries. So, so then we again have PR issue because like, of course, this is good that, you know, somebody wrote a book on that. So now yeah. we get to know about this because I think a lot of things implicit in Eastern culture also we don't know or we disregard because we don't have proper documentation. <clears throat> no, no, no. So this one is apparently very well documented. Yeah. And this is something apparently which is legendary in the business circles. I mean, okay. you and I don't move in that circle. Right, That's right, why we right. don't know it. Right. But uh, apparently the business folks know this in and out. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. And we need, yeah. I think, similar things in science as well. Of course we do. We do. Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, so that was a pleasure talking, you know, discussing so much. So I think we covered from undergraduate to <laughs> to to faculty and tenure what else is left like uh, i think we can discuss nobel prizes <laughs> about what <laughs> what do you think I mean, of 
<laughs> so what do you think of prizes in general in science? Uh, uh, there is argument that, okay, it incentivizes people, but then there are arguments uh, that that should not be the case. Uh, uh, not having an award just kind of keeps things more pure or there's, a, there's that kind of argument, like a Puritan argument. Yeah. End of the day, science yeah. is a social activity, right? Yeah. And as we have been discussing throughout this uh, entire, you know, series, you know, entire last one hour or so, right. science, we like it or not, yeah. it end of the day, it has to happen in the context of our society, within the framework of our society, right? Yeah. So in a social context, it's nice to celebrate things yeah. because only when you celebrate things do other people see it. Right. And they say, okay, I aspire to be like this. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Think of your APJ uh, thing, right? Yeah, yeah. If you, if APJ had not become famous like that, and if yeah. you had not known about it, you would not have written to him and so on, right? Right. And right. that's where your dream of going into a ICER or IIT had come right. about. So some of these celebrations are nice from motivational purposes. Hmm. And therefore, they, these celebrations also play a major role in maintaining the cohesion of the group, in maintaining the cohesion of the society. Yeah. Which is why if you look at any society, any right. in the yeah. world, there will always be festivals. Mm. Okay, There will always be occasions of looking at something and saying, wow. Yeah. And that is the primary purpose that awards should serve. Mm. Okay. It should yeah. not be about, you know, giving $10 million to that person or $20 million to that person. Yeah. It's about recognizing. It's about, you know, patting on the back and saying, yeah. good job. Okay. So that's about it. Okay. Some awards become more... Political, yeah, than others. Yeah. yeah. Political, etc. That's a different ballgame. But yeah. I think the general concept of awards uh, should be there. Right. Okay. And so... Uh, uh, Two more um, things, at least I would like to ask you. One is regarding uh, scientists having political opinions. So how political should, should do scientists? Because I th I see lately uh, a lot of science is turning into activism. Uh, so for example, uh, I mean, there's more value judgment about a person than science, uh, you know, which is happening recently. For example, you can go back in time and based on an earlier ethics, cancel someone, for example, right? Uh, yeah. right, and uh, and the whole masses masses come around them like a Twitter basically parade against someone and things like that. So my argument has been like that. Let's say we know somebody and somebody has some biases against uh things, or somebody is amoral according to some standards, but might be an amazing geneticist, and who knows the person might be come up with a cure for uh, Parkinson's, right? Uh, compared to we want everyone to be like a really nice behaving person and having nice opinion and something which is very uh, collegiate. I mean, do we have space? Should we have space for these people who have their biases, who are imperfect, but they're really, really good at what they do and we should value them for what they do because that's what society wants from them and not being nice. Like what would we gain? We are having the 10 nicest people around doing science. See, I kind of agree with what you are saying there because yeah. I think this modern tendency, okay, if yeah. you don't hold these values, yeah. then you shall be cancelled. You yeah. do not, you are not worthy of being in the society. You are not going to be in the society. Yeah. I think the term for this used to be intolerance. Right. Okay. Yeah. And if you are intolerant towards somebody just because according to your moral standards, that is not fitting your moral, your ethical standards, yeah. it is still intolerance. I don't care how great your standard is, but it is still intolerance. Yeah. So I sincerely feel that, first of all, people in a bygone era should not be judged. Hmm. Okay. They were living in their times based on the their, you know, views and based on that current... Uh, whatever setting, we have no clue about what it was. We have no idea about what they went through. And yeah. therefore, retroactive cancellation makes zero sense to me. Yeah, I can't bring myself to it. Even, you know, present day cancellation, I don't understand that either. Yeah. 
I mean, what exactly gives me the moral authorities? I mean, take the J.K. Rowling issue, for example. Yeah. All right. What gives me the moral authority to cancel somebody who, in my view, is transphobic? Yeah. Okay. If that person actually goes about doing something which is causing bodily harm to trans people or goes about doing, you know, uh, talking about certain policies, which in my view are going to bring harm to some set of people, I will stand up and say that, look, I disagree with you. Right. That doesn't give me the right to say that burn all Harry Potter books. It simply yeah. doesn't. Okay. Yeah. If it does, then I'm worse than you know that person who simply expressed his or her views. Yeah. And I know this is going to make me unpopular. Yeah. But this is something that I would really like to, you know, I, I think lots of people who are into this canceling business and their numbers yeah. are growing, yeah. they should really stop for a minute and think that tomorrow, if somebody else has you know, thinks that one of your views are bad, yeah. then they cancel you, then what right. the hell are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Because at any given point of time, you are never sure what is in and what is out. Right. So that is becoming a cult. And also, I think it creates a culture of dishonesty because if I'm not yes. sure whether my opinion would be, and I see it, this in conferences, you know, like now scientific conferences, right? Uh, I mean, I don't go to you, them. I'm very happy about that. The, the, I mean, the, 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 uh, there are reasons not to go, there are reasons to go yeah, yeah, still. No. But at the same time, uh, I see them becoming more like uh, a kind of a vacation uh, than actually a real scientific discourse. I don't think this discourse happens. It's like a show because now you're not allowed to uh, offend anyone or ask questions or, you know, things like that. So, uh, there's an increased pressure to be like correct about things, you know. So when you are under, it's like I really feel that we should do some 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 sociological experiments, like uh, where we actually do uh, check people's cortisol levels at conferences versus and see whether the cortisol levels actually come down and or go up. That everyone is trying to judge them for what they can speak and what not, <laughs> and you would see that, <laughs> you know, it's you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so, it might be the case. You know, I kind of agree with you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is no safe sp space anymore. Yeah. You are it's, being constantly judged. Yeah, Every, it's, it's it's considered to be safe space, but it's like it's it's actually not safe space. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. agree. And incidentally, the yeah. people who shout maximum about safe space yeah. are many a times the ones who actually end up doing this kind of No, of course. Person. I mean, of but, course, cons cons consistently. Consistently. Yeah, so, so yeah. you know, if you are so bothered about safe space for yourself, right. yeah, wouldn't you be bothered about safe space for others? others yeah. well? No, this is what actually I was raised in. Like when, when, when you know, when we were at ISER, when I was there, uh, we had this culture of like almost. But I was raised in a scientific, uh, uh, you know, environment or culture of basically questioning everything and be kind of a little rowdy about it and things like that. You know. Uh, so I often crave for those kind of interactions, you know, now because departmental structures are changing the kind of interactions, you are generally more cautious. Uh, and, and when you read the biographies of older scientists, right, whether you're talking about uh, the most famous Richard Feynman or, or uh, Freeman Dyson or, or just take anyone, right, uh, and more so from the first community, and you see this political incorrectness, or I would say like honesty as part of the discourse, uh, you know, of how they... Uh, it, it it might be a uh, an artifact of history, but it seems to be the case. Look, yeah. I mean, there are several aspects of Richard Feynman's behavior, yeah, which I personally didn't like yeah. when I read about read his biography. You know, when I was in I think where was I? I was in BSc, I think. Yeah. Okay. And I definitely found that, okay, this doesn't make sense. I yeah. don't like this aspect. Yeah. But at the same time, there were several aspects of his personality that I liked. Yeah. And therefore, I ended up appreciating some parts of it and I ended up right, not appreciating right. other parts of him. Right. And for me, that made him a real person. 
yeah as opposed to you know somebody from a disney movie or right, somebody right. from a hollywood production where everybody is either black or white and nothing in between right 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 isn't right. it no so, yeah and, and by so, the way you were the one who recommended me richard feynman's book books i know so. <laughs> and if, if, if you tell that today probably i will be cancelled for recommending his <laughs> yeah so i, I surely you are you are joking mr feynman i was a little late to read but uh, but you were the one who recommended me And, and you enjoyed it, right? Others. Oh, of course, of course. I mean, I read all of his, all of his yeah. books, uh, including the Feynman lectures, uh, which are the more technical stuff. But yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I still yeah, read. I just read a uh, the uh, one of the biographies of Paul Dirac, uh, mm-hmm. and the name of the book is The Strangest Man, and the book is all about Paul Dirac not being fit and not being correct, and how that incorrectness and inappropriateness was actually uh, what made him Paul Dirac. and his contributions and there are a lot of things about him which people would like to cancel or go back and try to cancel him and uh, you know things or at least uh, you know yeah no no i think this you know this is taking moral policing to a very yeah. undesirable end yes and i think people you know younger people because yeah. i primarily see this as a disease of relatively younger people although right, right. i have to admit some middle aged folks yeah. my generation is also important in it <laughs> right right but i think all of them really need uh, to get their acts together and say yeah let's right. you know let's go back towards tolerance right right now we should be able to enjoy a cup of coffee with our uh, you know most revered enemies as well absolutely so right you learn so much from yeah. your enemies yeah I mean, me and you, me and you. I think we don't agree on a lot of things. Like a lot of politics, we will not agree. A lot of economics, we will not agree. But at the same time, you know, that doesn't uh, change I how mean, we interact or how we judge each that, other. That was the case when you were here, right? Yeah. The number of heated arguments that you yes. and I have had yes. are quite a few, right? Right, right. Including, you know, late in the night, right. Because you have the heated arguments, that's yeah. when you understand. See, right. Just. i understand that you are different yeah that increases my appreciation for you yeah. you should not decrease my appreciation for exactly you. and that was that's also what bring people together make long term relationship and let you invest in others uh, i mean unless you realize those texture and those inconsistencies there's no way you can make long term bonds with anyone i don't even call it inconsistency inconsistency yeah. i call it texture everybody texture, has yeah. their textures yeah. and you appreciate the person for their texture for the texture yeah Okay, if everybody as smooth as ice, right, right. So there is no variety left. Right, right, right. I think that's also coming from my training in evolutionary biology, right? As evolutionary biologists, you variety... need <laughs> you, yeah. you 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 need variety to begin with. You need exactly right. Exactly. And 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 actually, if you think of from a from a management standpoint, how the culture grows, uh, that's when a culture becomes dead or civilization becomes dead when texture disappears, right? Yes. You make people yes. homogeneous, and yes. you don't get any. Uh, yes. robustness in us in us in an evolutionary environment absolutely yes and that is a huge problem with today's management policies in many yeah. places yeah. management treats people as exchangeable okay yeah. okay this group needs a programmer take one programmer from here and put that programmer there right. okay that group needs a manager okay let's buy one manager from that company and put them here right send work right okay whatever setup we are in we yeah. are all humans we right. have our own peculiarities right and if you simply take somebody and you know transplant them yeah these are not machine parts that you you know take from one machine and put them in another so uh, this i was reading last night actually in a book uh, uh, that how people are realizing that the low is the the comp is a contribution of context the more replaceable employees are and the more context they are trying to deal with the yes. difficult it is to replace them to swap yes. them Yes, so it is absolutely a, yes. your interaction with the context which is defining how replaceable or how irreplaceable you absolutely are. Absolutely so. Absolutely so. Absolutely so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. See, if somebody is only let's say lifting weight. Yes. Okay. Without any consideration of what weight is being lift, lifted, yeah. then it doesn't matter. Anybody can lift that weight. Right. When that person is interacting with a bunch of other. things right. and the person has trained himself or herself to become good in that context yeah okay, that's when simply removing that person and putting another person with similar skills and you're going to work 
that is why almost all the cases i won't say yeah. every case but a huge fraction of cases where you import your ceo from outside yeah without fail ends up in a disaster yeah i mean this has happened to so many companies in india recently why do you blame india it has happened all no, no, over uh, the world. those i know those i know huh. yeah, those i yeah, know yeah, yeah. Because of all pers- people, yeah. it's the CEO who has yeah. to have the maximum context. Right, right. right? And you just take somebody who doesn't even understand that business, doesn't understand the ethics of that company, doesn't understand the value system of that company. Right. And then you suddenly tell them, ha, bhai, you know, to start right. improving the profit from tomorrow. No, sometimes they actually start improving the profit as well. And Nicholas Nassim Taleb has talked about this in his book, Full Barrenness, mm-hmm. uh, that... I mean, some systems are destined to fail or to grow and CEO gets all the credit just because they are coming there at the right time. Uh, yes, so, but that's a short-term thing. Yeah. If the CEO doesn't understand yeah. how the place ticks and is yeah. not able to take strategic decisions which are congruent with those, you know, how the place ticks, yeah. then even if you are having a short-term increase in profit, right. in the long run, you are doomed to die. Right. And I think we have seen this in academic theories as well, right? In different fields, when you have a theoretical homogeneity, also fields have died or fields have actually gone out of fashion at least. Which uh, one are you thinking? I mean, let's say a lot of like, let's say sociobiology. Uh, No. Sociobiology is doing okay, right? Why do you think sociobiology is dead? No, it's not dead, but it's definitely not there in that... uh, in in that form. See, I don't know which aspect you are talking about, but yeah. any field, when it is first started, yeah. there is a period of logarithmic growth. Yeah. Okay. Almost anything that you touch is new. Right. And therefore, you know, you see a lot of activity happening. Then at some point, things settle down. Okay. Mm-hmm. A lot of competing hypothesis people choose one or the other and yeah. somewhere there is a contraction almost yeah. but a um, contraction and a compaction what yeah. happened together and then for some time the field kind of you know is at a like a stable thing hmm. and after that a second phase of growth may or yeah. may not happen or it might happen after some time yeah but that doesn't necessarily mean that the field is dying it simply means that the field is you know, all the low-hanging fruits are taken and now the field is doing the grunt work yeah, and yeah. trying to solve the harder problems. Right. Okay. I mean, look at physics, for example. That's what yeah. is happening in physics, right? Yeah. No, I so... Uh, uh, physics I also like because of, uh, I think, publication process, which we were talking about before, is so much smoother in physics. So recently, I have started publishing some in physics journals because my work has, the nature of work has gone there. And when I look at APS, for example, American Physical Society, the review process and submission process and the submission and the and the pricing and everything, uh, it still seems to be uh, you know much more coherent and have a structure to it than uh, you know than. Yes. Uh, That's because as of now, it's a less crowded field. Let it yeah, become that, as crowded as biology, and you'll see. Yeah, that happens. might be the case. That's why fifteen or twenty of those journals are still you know making the field float. Of the minute, yeah. Right. So, sir, uh, yeah. one last question I have for you is, uh, let's say, which I also asked Shraddha, and Shraddha liked it because she always wanted to become a dictator since she was in class two. Dictator? Yeah. So I asked her, uh, what would you do if you become a dictator to solve this issue? Uh, and you have all the dictatorial rights. And she thanked me to ask that question because, because since somebody asked her uh, when she was in class two, what you want to become? And she said that, Everything first woman has been taken. So I want to be the first woman dictator. <laughs> so Okay. There has been no woman dictator? Uh, I'm pretty confident there has been. We just have to I mean there are, there have been dictatorial or dictator kind le- woman leaders, but I don't know whether we have had a dictator of no, some but see, yeah. see, 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 no dictator ever calls himself or herself the dictator, right? So, for example, Hitler was called the Chancellor of Germany. Right, right. The Führer. Right, okay. yeah. The Western or, I mean, the English-speaking world or whatever, the Allies They'll call him a dictator. dictator. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I don't think they I mean, people can call Margaret Thatcher dictator, some people, but but still, I don't think she was close to what a dictator can be. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, let's. Uh, so, I mean, basically, she still had room for like becoming the first. At least she wanted to become like a real good dictator. So, <laughs> so, uh, so let's say you have you become a dictator and you have all the dictatorial dictatorial rights, uh, you know, and privileges. Uh, how what would you do to change the structure of science, starting from uh, like early education to basically uh, uh, you know post tenure and in general funding and everything? Like, what kind of major moves would you take to reshape things? One move that I would take is to increase publicly funded education, yeah. both at the primary level and at the higher level, the university level, and bring in some administrative changes to make the university system function with a greater amount of uh, how do I say, transparency, but essentially Right now, there is a major move towards going towards public, uh, so towards uh, private. Yeah, I want to come back towards the public uh, education and public research system. And uh, we already discussed about uh, the publication, you know, this yeah. complete mess about the publication. And as I said, yeah, you just the kind of things that I said, just you know, declare that this is the maximum publication fee that we are yeah. going to give, give yeah. it or take it. And then if necessary, create using our own science academies by getting into collaboration with other, you know, like Chinese Academy of Sciences and almost every country has their own science academies, getting all those science academies under one umbrella and creating journals which are publicly funded. Yeah. And therefore, the I mean, there is no profit, no loss. And everybody, you know, gets to publish in them for free and the articles become free for everybody. Yeah, that I think will go a long way in uh, taking care of things, and I would like to, if possible, do some of these group selection business that I was talking about in terms of uh, faculty performances. So right now, the entire faculty performance thing is based on individual level stuff. Yeah. I would like to probably come up with some mechanisms by which an entire department is function uh, is uh, funded you know depending on what the right. department has been able to do and of course right. one has to come up with appropriate matrix for that yeah but uh, yeah that, that i think would be an interesting thing to do put the yeah. selection not at the individual level but put the selection at the institute level or at the department level i right. have a feeling that that will lead to a lot of uh, interesting dynamics in science Oh, uh, as well as uh, some people might get back that it will also breed some parasitism, parasitism within the departments as well, uh, because you know, kind of a, when the, when the department selection, department selection is ensured by like ten people, two people will basically be like you know evolutionary cheaters. Uh, but think about it: if those yeah. two people are cheaters, yeah, then the department has a massive incentive to throw to, them out. To throw them out, yeah. Isn't it? Right, right. This, this, would... right. this is more at the level of funding. Right. Yes. Exactly. Right. Because that's what a dictator can do, right? I can't go and do the research for everybody. But I can, yes. as a dictator, I can control the funding flow. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, th those are those are great points. I think they, they systematically deal with three major issues. Uh, and basically, they're dealing with incentive structure at three different levels. Exactly. End of the day, that's what yeah. I believe as an evolutionary biologist. Everything is in the incentive structures. Yeah. Solve the incentive structures and at least some mm -hmm. things will get sorted. New problems will be created, but at least yeah. some of the old problems will disappear. Right. You know, there's a there's actually a very a scope of, I don't think there's a book on that, uh, a very deep book on two things I feel. Uh, and I, was, I have been feeling since I started reading this kind of literature since my high school. One is incentive structure and the second is conflict of interest. Yeah. Because... The two are close, closely related, because yeah, the proper they're, they're related, but one is more financial and one is more uh, related to the power play. No, no, no. When I say incentive structure, yeah. it is not merely financial. Okay, you're talking incentive... about both things. Okay. Well, yeah, entire yeah. thing. Okay, okay, why should somebody want to do something? Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean by an incentive. Right, right, it can right. be money. It can be power. It can be whatever. right, 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 right. Like clearing the jung this jungle of, you know, the the kind of a mess of uh, conflict of interest is also, I think, uh, is... Yes, it's part of the in incentive yeah, structure. A, yeah. a good incentive structure is one where the conflicts of interest are minimal. Are minimal, yes. Awesome. 
So that it was great talking to you and catching up with a lot of things and talking science education uh, yeah, for viewers who, uh, to remind, you know, uh, 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 sir is one of the best science educators I know of and he has produced, um, you know, to feel good about myself, he has produced amazing students who are uh, faculty right now all over the world and we are soon, and he was he's soon planning to have a, a kind of a get-together of... Uh, uh, a possible get together of uh, all the faculties, right, who have come out of his lab and from his mentorship. Yeah, that would be really nice. That's yeah. something we should try to do. It'll yeah, be, it'll be yeah. good to meet everybody. I'll, I'll I'll coordinate with you, sir, on that regard. Awesome, sure. Sir, Take great. Care. Have a have a great night. Yeah. 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 Same Bye. to you. Bye. 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 Take care.